in Galatians 5, verse number 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. We're going to look at the first uh, 22 verses of this chapter, and if you have read ahead, you know that this is a um, brutal story, difficult story to read, uh, much less to preach about. So, you know, David, David was a good man, and David did a lot of really good stuff, but David also had some weaknesses, and one of his weaknesses was issues with women. In particular, he had a lot of wives, which is something that God did not. Um, encourage or endorse. And so consequently, by disobeying God in that regard, and by having so many different wives, we're, we're starting to see him reaping what he has sown. And, and this is a little case of this here, uh, and this is a, what we're going to deal with kind of a lot going forward, is David makes some choices in his earlier life and he pays for them in his later life. And, and this is a case between his kids. So he has uh, multiple wives. We, I don't know that we know an exact number, but he's in double digits in wives. Um, and he marries uh, one woman named, it's, it's, it's spelled A-H-I-N-O-A, uh, she was from Jezreel, and when he was king in Judah, she gave him a son, and his name was Ammon. And that was actually David's firstborn son. So, so in, if we're going to go by the line of David, and the firstborn son would be the one that would be the next king. So David's going to be the next king. Um, or uh, David is the king, and Ammon then would be the next king. So he's the firstborn. It's David's firstborn son, and he's going to be the next heir. He also... Uh, married a woman named Mekah. She was the daughter of Talmai, who was king of Gesher. Uh, this may have been an alliance kind of thing to keep the peace, or he just found her incredibly attractive because they produced some unbelievable children. Uh, they produced two kids. One was Tamar, who we're going to talk about today, and the other was Absalom. And actually, the Bible describes Absalom as entirely perfect from the top of his head to the bottom of his foot, not not spiritually wise, but in his appearance. So if you could paint a picture of the perfect man, he was that. He was tall, dark, and handsome. Legit. Um, and because the Bible describes him in that way. Well, if he was that way, I doubt severely that Tamar was ugly. Uh, she was probably also a very beautiful woman as well. So what you have is you have all of these wives, and they're producing uh, and David has all these wives, and they're producing all of these kids, and these kids are all growing up together, uh, and, and they're in the palace, and they're in the house, and so, you know, it's some really uh, interesting dynamics is going on, okay? So, if you have your Bibles, and they're not all up on the screen, but I'm going to walk through the story, and then we'll, we'll come back and spend the last 10 minutes of the sermon going through the points, uh, because what I want to really get you to think about today is, who are you listening to? Uh, everybody has somebody in their ear, and who are you listening to? And so we're going to conclude the sermon by talking about, don't listen to these people, but do listen to these, okay? So let's read this story. Uh, after this, Absalom, the son of David, had a lovely sister whose name was Tamar. And Ammon, the son of David, loved her. So the, you got these half-brothers and sisters, and a Ammon, who is the firstborn and to be next king, is in love with his half-sister. Okay. Now, relationships between uh, incest or relationships between brothers and sisters, even if they're half-brothers and sisters, was condemned in Scripture. And it was condemned in Leviticus uh, chapter 18, I believe, verse 11. You have... so. So it's pretty clearly laid out. You are not to have, uh, you're not to be married or have sexual relations with your own family. Which even in in the looseness of our culture right now, that's still something that's kind of frowned upon. Okay. 
And, and it was the way then. But Ammon is in love with Tamar. He's in love with his half-sister. And it says in verse number 2 that he was so distressed over his sister Tamar that he became sick, for she was a virgin, and it was improper for Ammon to do anything to her. He wants something so bad that he's sick about it, that he's literally has lost his appetite. And I think everybody in this room can somewhat relate to that in the sense that um, this should be what fasting is, for example. When we fast and pray, we, we desire something so bad that it takes our appetite away. If you've ever had a sick child and you want that child to be well, and, you have just, uh, and, and you're so distraught over your child that you can't eat, uh, because, and somebody comes alongside and says, man, you need to get something to eat, uh, this is a very similar thing, except it's in the wrong way. It's, it's, it's passion for something that he can't have. So there's a lot of indicators in the text, and there's a lot of indicators we're going to talk about later, that Ammon was a sexual predator, that he was uh, somebody who had this insatiable appetite for sex and preyed on women and used his power to get what he wanted. So he is, this is his driving force, sex is his driving force, and he's got this half-sister that he wants bad. Verse 3 says, But Ammon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother. Now, Jonadab was a very crafty man. That's, that's, not, a, that's not a good compliment there, okay? So he said to him, so um, um, Jonadab said to Ammon, Why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner day after day? Obviously, what happens when you don't eat is you lose weight. And uh, the opposite is when you eat a whole lot. <laughs> Just for my own sake. There, I said that. Um, um, so why are you getting thinner day by day? He says, will you not tell me? So Ammon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Now, this is not biblical love. This is lust. He doesn't love Tamar. He lusts after Tamar. And that's proven later, because in our culture, we're defining, redefining what love is. Love is not lust. Because I want to be in bed with somebody doesn't mean I love them. It means I lust after them. Okay? And that's, he's not in love. He thinks he's in love, but he's in lust. So this is what Jonadab says in verse 5. Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me food and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. So, he doesn't finish the story, does he? He just says, this is what you should do. You should act like you're sick, and then you should request that Tamar, request from your dad, that Tamar bring the food in. And once again, I think there's some, there's some warning signs here, and there's some indication that people tried to stay away from Ammon. So, Tamar's not going to go see him unless dad tells her to go see him. They don't have a relationship. They don't enjoy each other's company. They're actually staying away from each other. And I think Tamar is avoiding Ammon for a particular reason. So Ammon lay down, verse 6, and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Ammon said to the king, Please let Tamar, my sister, come and make a couple of cakes for me in my sight that I may eat from her hand. Let her be my nurse. And David sent home to Tamar, saying, good, Now go to your brother Ammon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Ammon's house, and he was lying down. Then she took flour and kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and placed them out before him, but he refused to eat. Then Ammon said, Have everyone go out from me. And they all went out from him. Then Ammon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them to Ammon, her brother, in the bedroom. Now when she had brought them to him to eat, he, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. But she answered him, No, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing should be done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. So she's pleading with him. Uh, she has made pretty clear that the answer is what? No, okay. And no means, okay. So not only does she say no, but she makes an argument, right? She, she pleads with him not to do this. This is a disgraceful thing. And then she goes on to talk more about it. She says, you know, 
He, she says, and I, where would I take my shame? And as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to my king, for he will not withhold me from you. Now, do you think Tamar really wants to be with Ammon? I don't think so. I think this is like if somebody's got a gun to your head, you're going to say whatever you got to say. So she's like, please stop. She's trying to buy some time is what she's doing. She's like, please, let's go talk to dad about this. Okay, that's exactly what she's doing. She doesn't want to be with him. She's just trying to buy some time. She's got a gun to her head. And, and she, she's trying to get out of the room, and she's trying, to, she's trying to get away from the place. But, verse 14, he would not heed her voice, and being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. Now, if he loves her, and he's just been with her, uh, wouldn't this, if, if it's love, wouldn't it make the relationship deeper and stronger, right? But that's not what happens. Then Ammon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love which he had loved her. And Ammon said to her, Arise and be gone. So she said to him, No, indeed, this evil of sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Now, what does that mean? Well, one of the things you will not find in Scripture anywhere is any endorsement for casual sex. Okay? Okay? Well, I just, you know, just casual sex. We're just, we just had a one-night stand. Not acceptable anywhere in Scripture. If you sleep with somebody, that is like being married to them. That's the act of marriage. So if you sleep with someone, even if you rape her, then it's your responsibility to care for that woman and that child. I mean, David was wrong in the sense that he married all these women, but at least he married them all and took care of them. Okay, so, so the Bible says pretty clear that, look, if, if you have sexual intercourse with somebody, you now have a responsibility. Now you're a couple. Okay, and now you have a responsibility to care for one another. In particular, as the man, you have a responsibility to care for this woman that you've had sex with. You're not just like, man, man you know, it's good, good for me, and see you later. That's not how it works. So she's like, all right, look, you raped me. I didn't want to be with you. Then... You have responsibilities now. Now you need to take care of me. So if you, if you abandon me, if you push me out and you don't take care of me, then this is going to be worse than what you've just done. Because now I can't marry again, and I'm, I'm in a bad, bad way. I'm not a virgin anymore. You, you, you've got to take care of me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servants who attended him and said, here, put this woman out. Now, now he's not even called her by her name, right? I mean, the guy was in absolute lust with her five minutes ago. But now he's like, can't stand her. I want her out of my sight. This is a massive abuse of power, is it not? Get her out of here. No, the, the, um, he says, put this woman out away from me and bolt the door behind her. Now she had on a, on a robe of many colors for the king's daughters wore such apparel and his servant put her out and bolted the door behind her. Then Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her robe of many colors that was on her and, lay, and laid her hand on her head and went away crying bitterly. And Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Ammon, your brother, been with you? Now this is the first indicator right here that he, he had a reputation and he was probably a sexual predator because she's upset and what's the first thing that Absalom thinks? Ammon did something to you, didn't he? He knows it right away. He doesn't even, she doesn't even have to say anything. But he knows that Ammon's done something. And then he says, uh, has Ammon your brother been with you? And he doesn't even allow her to answer the question. So, you know, you kind of get this visual where maybe she nods her head or she gives him some kind of a sign, or she looks him in the eye. And he says, but now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this thing to heart. In other words, don't speak up. Don't say anything. Keep it in the family. Don't let this get out. It's going to hurt dad. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. Now, this is, this is 
David was a lot of great things. He was a horrible dad because he did nothing to his son. He, he, he got upset about it. Doggone it, you. But he didn't do anything else. He's just upset about it. He didn't punish his son. He didn't do anything. He was just angry that it happened. So, and Absalom spoke to his brother Ammon, neither good nor bad. So Absalom kept a relationship. And the reason why he kept a relationship is what we're going to talk about next week. Because he, he wanted revenge. And he was going to make sure that his sister was vindicated. And he was going to do it by his own hand. So he, he, he kept the relationship. He didn't love him and hate him. He just kept the relationship with him because he wanted to kill him. It says, for Absalom hated Ammon because he had forced his sister Tamar. Brutal, brutal, brutal story. There's some truths, though, that we can get from this. There are, you have voices speaking to you, and there are some that you should listen to, and there are some that you should ignore. Let me give you four that you should ignore and four that you should listen to. One, don't listen to the flesh. Don't listen to the flesh. The flesh, let me, let me read Galatians 5 for you. You can turn there if you want. I'm going to read a few verses. In Galatians 5, verse number 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the flesh, my old man, is constantly encouraging me to do all of these things that I have just talked about. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts. My flesh is constantly speaking to me to do these things. Um, lose your temper, uh, have an outburst of wrath, do what you want, envy somebody else, murder. It, the, I'm constantly being pulled by the flesh to do this. So what does that mean for me personally? It means the flesh is in my ear all the time. It's always in my ear. This is what you want. And it's, it's pulling me the wrong direction from the Spirit of God, from the direction of God. So what I must learn to do in my life is not listen to my flesh. Not listen to the lust of my flesh. Because what will happen is, is if this is not of God, if this is of my flesh, then once I do it, I will feel regret. I will feel remorse. I will feel conviction of the Holy Spirit. I will not feel satisfaction by doing what the flesh wants me to do. Fulfilling the flesh only creates a bigger monster. So Ammon was with this woman. It didn't take, take away the desire to be with another woman, but it created more of a desire and more of a desire and more of a desire. And so Ammon lived his entire life just listening to the flesh, listening to the flesh, gratifying the flesh. Now, what was he? He was in a position of power. He was in a position of influence. He could get what he wanted. He was the son of the king. There was nothing that was not available to him, so he could constantly gratify his flesh. And so it just spoke to him and spoke to him. So what he wanted, he got. So instead of listening to the flesh, verse 22 says, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. But those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. In other words, what Paul's saying is don't listen to the flesh because the flesh will lead you astray. It will make you miserable. 
follow the Spirit of God that leads in your life. So don't listen to the flesh. Ammon listened to his flesh. I want that woman, even though I can't have that woman. And that when he got what he wanted, it did not satisfy him, but it brought him more frustration. Two, don't listen to people who encourage you to hurt others. Don't listen to people who encourage you to hurt others. Jonadab is no kind of friend at all. Now, let me tell you something about life. You can always find somebody that will agree with you if you ask long enough. You can. You can find somebody who will say, this is what you should do. And this is exactly what Ammon did. Ammon went around till he got somebody who said, take her, man. You're the king's son. And I just want to encourage you, do not listen to people who in any way encourage you to hurt others. Do not listen to them. Do not take their advice. They do not have the interest of God at heart. They have their own interest, and they're just saying it to make you feel better as a friend. And they are no friend at all. Do not listen to people who encourage you to hurt others. Um, And you will have people in your life give you horrific advice. Remember uh, Peter, when he said to Jesus, I mean, Jesus is telling him, I'm going to be crucified, and Peter's like, no, you're not. And what did, what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Did you know that God can use really, really, that God, God, Satan can use really good people in your life to give you really horrible advice that can lead to your destruction? Make sure that the advice that you're getting is is from God and it is not just to gratify your flesh. Don't listen to people who encourage you to hurt others. Number three, do not listen to people who tell you to get over it. Don't listen to people who tell you to get over it. What does Tamar do when she goes to Absalom? She, she basically, she's, she's obviously upset. She's upset by her appearance, and she's upset by her demeanor. I think Tamar was a beautiful woman, not just externally, but I think internally. And man, when you have somebody who is a bubbly personality that then all of a sudden is not so bubbly, something's happened. All right? Something has happened. So... Something had happened to Tamar, and, and, hit, and brother, sister knew it. Absalom knew it. So Absalom says, did, Ta- did, did uh, Ammon rape you? And she, said, she gave him the indication. And, and I want to tell you, Absalom gave her horrific advice. And what was that advice? Keep it quiet. Keep it quiet now because it's going to make a mess of the family. There's going to be a lot of tension. There's going to be a lot of dysfunction. You keep it quiet. I'll take care of it. Okay, now, first of all, that's not his place. I know you want to protect your sister. I get what you're trying to do, but that's not your place. The place is is this needs to be exposed. This is, these are not statistics from Christian organizations. This is from secular organizations. And it breaks my heart to read this or to say it out loud because, because of what it means for the people in this room in the sense that there, I understand that every week I preach to a lot of hurting people. One in three women have been sexually abused in their life. One in six males have been sexually abused. They say that 40% of the people in America have been abused some way, either verbally, sexually, in some way, 40% of the people. So almost half of the people that I preach to every week have 
have experienced some kind of abuse. And this is why this sermon is brutal for me to preach, and it's brutal probably for you to listen to, because it may be like taking the Band-Aid and peeling it off. And I, and I, but I can't ignore the text because I think God has it here for a reason. But I just want to encourage you to speak up and to get help. If you have been abused, the worst thing you can do is keep it in. So I want to challenge you. I want to encourage you. Um, I, 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 I want to plead with you to get help, get some counseling, go talk to a counselor. You need to talk to somebody about this. You need to get, get it out in the open. You need to get help. We have counselors here that we would recommend for you to go to. You go over the table. Paula actually has cards that she will give you of counselors that you can call, and, and we can get you some help. But I want to encourage you to speak up and get help. Do not keep it in. Because I'm going to tell you what happened. You never, ever hear of Tamar again. Ammon destroyed her. And he des- not only did he destroy her, but her brother destroyed her because he told her to keep quiet. And so it literally says, the, the text implies that she just basically died an old widow in her brother's house. Died miserable and alone because she listened to a bunch of guys who told her to keep her mouth shut. Don't go tell dad. Don't get, don't, let's keep it in the family. Don't do, don't do this. And I'm telling you, don't listen to people who tell you to get over it. You may be hurting in this room, and, and I'm not going to stand up here and say, just get over it. A lot deeper than that. Number four, don't listen to yourself. Don't listen to yourself. Let me just say this. I already kind of gave away a little bit, but we never hear from Tamar again. This completely wrecks her, and and I think that probably this one event did destroy her, and I just want to remind you that you are not defined by what happens to you. You are defined by who you belong to. Don't ever forget that. You are not defined by what happens to you. You are defined by who you belong to. And who you are is a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God is not finished with you yet. And he is not done with you yet. And, And though you may feel unworthy, and though you may feel broken, and though you may feel alone, he has not abandoned you, and he still has a plan for you, and he can still use you in a great way. And then the worst thing we do is we listen to ourselves. And we have events like this happen to us, and we listen to ourselves, and we beat ourselves up, and we speak negativity into our lives instead of listening to what God's word says about us. Do not believe what you think about yourself. Believe what God says about you. And you are loved, and you are cared for, and God can use you in a great way. So do not listen to yourself. And I think that what happened to Tamar is she started listening to herself. And she felt shame, and she felt disgust, and it just, it's just snowballed for her, and she was never the same. Let's end on the positives. Five, do listen to God's Word. Do listen to God's Word. Let me ask you a question. Did, did uh, Ammon know that this was wrong? That's why he was so vexed about it, right? Because he, he, he really wanted this woman, and up to this point, he could have any woman in the kingdom he wanted, but he really wanted this one, but he knew that it was forbidden in Leviticus. He knew that God said, no, this isn't right. But he did it anyway. Where the word of God clearly says to not do something, I would highly challenge you to not do it. Because you cannot run from the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing in the dividing soul. Uh, uh, I don't know the rest of the verse, but it's a good one. The Word of God is powerful, right? It is, it, is, it, it, it is my guidebook for life. And when I go counter to what God says, if you love God, you will keep His commandments, right? You will do what He says. So do listen to God's Word. And, and 
If you, if you violate the word of God, can you find forgiveness? Can you find grace? Can you find mercy? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I would recommend that you just listen to it to begin with. Because we could eliminate a lot of pain if we just do what God's word says from the beginning. In two years... Ammon's going to be dead. And he's going to be dead because he did something that ticked off Absalom, who then, rather than giving it to God, took vengeance on himself. He got in this position because he ignored God's word to begin with. And then it's just like, we, just, we kind of snowball in life. We go from disobeying God's word to disobeying God's word to disobeying God's word, and then hoping it'll turn out good. And then getting bitter at God because it didn't turn out good. Listen to the word of God. It's here for our admonition, for our help, for our encouragement, for our life. Number six, do listen to the Holy Spirit. Do listen to the Holy Spirit. Look, I think that God's given us a couple of things to help us in life, okay? One is he's given us you can call it a sixth sense. You can call it your conscience. You can call it whatever. I think God's given us that. But I also think he's given us, as Christians, the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe that David is partly to blame here because he, allow, he basically sends Ammon into Tamar's house. Now, if this guy has a reputation... Why are the antennas not going up on dad? Because this is the truth. We want to believe everything good about our kids and nothing bad. Oh, my kids would never look at porn. Really? My kids would never do that. Do we want to believe the this is David. David always sees the sunny side. He just doesn't see, okay, he doesn't see the blaring elephant in the room that everybody else knows about, but David. He ignores the Holy Spirit who's saying, don't send this girl into that sexual predator. What is one of the main responsibilities I have as a parent to my children is to protect them, not put them in harm's way. What did he do with his own kid? Put it, put, he put Tamar in harm's way by sending his firstborn son in there. Look, man, if you're in a situation and you just feel, whoa, whoa, I mean, the light, lights are going off and this is a bad, then walk away. Don't be like, well, it'll all turn out good. That's naive. That's, I think it's foolish on your part. Now, you can, now I know people that completely live in fear and don't let their kids do anything and they put big bubbles around them and they can't. But, but look, you, you have to use some wisdom and you have to listen to the Holy Spirit because He is constantly speaking to us. Listen to what He says. Don't ignore Him. Don't brush Him off. Don't say, well, you know, I don't know. Listen to the Holy Spirit. And I think you have, you have people here, in particular David, who knows the reputation of his son, but sends his virgin daughter in there anyway. Number seven, do listen to people who care about you. You know what's amazing to me about this whole text? I think that Tamar really cares about Ammon in the sense that, that, um, that he is her brother, right? Right? Because notice what the text says. No, my brother, do not force me for no such thing should be done in Israel. So so she's obviously thinking about herself. She doesn't want to be raped and lose her virginity. But she says, and and where could I take my shame? He says, and as for you, you would be like one of the fools in Israel. How many of us have a great, uh, how many of of us have a great view of rapist? Oh, that guy's a good guy. He's just a rapist. Nobody ever says that, right? You never heard anything like that. So what does this say about Tamar? In her greatest, in her greatest moment of pressure, she's trying to get her brother to see the bigger picture. Look, 
If you do this, you'll be known as a rapist and you will be a fool in Israel for the rest of your life. Please listen to me. But who, who, is, who is Ammon listening to? His flesh, Jonadab, who laid out the plan for him. He's listening to everybody but the one who really cares about him, who's his sister. It just, I, I know next hour is when all the kids come in here, but it just blows me away, man. When you have teenage kids, and they got some other punk teenage kid friend, and you got parents that are begging their kids to do the right thing, and they're like, I'm, I'm going to go with the 15-year-old. I'm going to go with their advice. Hello. Let me see. This woman carried you in her womb, has cared for you when you couldn't care for yourself, has given you life, and now you're going you're gonna to ignore her advice and you're going to listen to somebody who, who is a, who's got the brilliance of a 14-year-old. That's foolish, right? But do people do it all the time? That kid doesn't care about you. That kid cares about him, and he wants somebody to do the crime with him. Mom and dad care about you. So that's why they're pleading with you. Please don't do this. I I love you. I care about you. Please don't go this direction. But what do we do, man? We get in our flesh, and we get in our sin, and we just want... We just want uh, to hear from people who will say what we want to hear. And look, let's not be too hard on the kids because mom and dads get the same way too. Are you all with me this morning? So if you have somebody in your life that is coming to you and saying, look, as a brother, man, I love you, and so I'm going to tell you this, and you're probably not going to want to hear it, I'd, I'd let my ears perk up. I know that you may find this a little hard to believe, but one time Karen and I are in this deep, I would not, I would call it a deep discussion. You might call it an argument. And look, I'm going to tell you what. I get a lot of stupid ideas in my head. There's a lot of things I want to do. And, uh, and, one, and if, I, if I could go back in our 28 years of marriage and change one thing, it'd be that I, I would stop making Karen my enemy so much. Because I'm pretty convinced now that there's nobody on this entire planet that loves me more than she does. So when she's like, Mark, because she doesn't, she's, you know, if you know Karen, she's not like, you will do this. So she tries to use subtle arguments with me. She wants me to change my mind. She's like, have you thought about this? Well, no, that's a stupid idea. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you one of the things that I think is helping us now after 28, and it's taken me 28 years to learn this, is that she really is on my side. And she really wants to help me. And she cares deeply about me. So if she's trying to say, you know, um, I think you ought to think about that, then I, my ears need to perk up. If you got people that love you and care about you, I don't even use the term love because this word love's got destroyed in this chapter. But if you got people that really care about you, I'd listen to what they say. And then I want to end on the most important thing. One is, don't listen to the what? Two, don't listen to people who encourage you to do what? Don't listen to people who tell you to. Don't listen to two. But do listen to. Do listen to the. And do listen to people who what? And let me give you the most important person to listen to. Number eight, do listen to Jesus. Would you read these verses with me? Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, 
Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy Whatever you have been through, Jesus is sympathetic. That's what that verse says. You say, well, Jesus Christ was never raped. No, but Jesus Christ was abused. Uh, I would call a cat, whipping by a cat of nine tails physical abuse that he did not deserve. Jesus Christ was verbally abused. He was verbally abused by the, by the people that he was crucified with. Remember? If you're the Son of God, get us down off this cross. And Jesus has got to be thinking, if you only knew. <laughs> right? He was mocked by the crowds. He was mocked by the soldiers. A crown of thorns was placed on his head, and a sign was put above that. The king of the Jews, right? Jesus Christ was verbally abused. And though he may not have been raped, Jesus Christ was sexually embarrassed. If you read the text, he did not hang from the cross clothed. He was sexually exposed. He was naked. He was mocked by those around him. So I just want to give you some encouragement. You can come to Jesus, and he is sympathetic to what you're going through. And he loves you deeply. So if you have been abused, Jesus cares for you and wants you to cry out to him. And he will come and help you in your time of need. He loves you and cares deeply for you. And how do I know that? Because his word tells me that. So come to him. Cry out to him. Take your concerns, take your cares, take your anxieties to the Lord, and He will sustain you. Father, I thank You for this time we've had today to study Your Word. What a brutal, difficult text to read and talk about. But there's so many wonderful truths uh, for us in this passage. And I pray, Lord, for the person that is here today, and they feel condemnation because of an act that was done to them maybe 20, 30, 40 years ago. They think that they are garbage. They think that they are trash because of what was done to them. Lord, I pray that right now that they would sense your love. That they would know that they would know that they are loved by you and that you are not done with them and they're not damaged goods, but that you have a wonderful plan for them. And I want to pray, Lord, for the person that is here that is maybe, maybe the abuser. Maybe they were the ones that have, have kind of dished out the verbal abuse or the physical abuse or God forbid, even the sexual abuse. And they have sat in this sermon today and they have felt condemnation and condemnation and condemnation. I pray, Lord, that they would come to the cross of Jesus today and that they would plead for forgiveness and that they would experience it. May the abused know that they are loved and may the abuser know that they can be forgiven if they would ask Jesus for forgiveness. So I pray for both groups today. I pray for those who have been abused that they can find healing and forgiveness. Not forgiveness, but peace in the name of Jesus. I pray that they would leave this place, that they would get some help, they would seek a counselor, they would speak out. And I pray for that person that's here that has been the abuser, that they would acknowledge their sin and they would seek forgiveness from Jesus Christ and from the person that they have wronged. Thank you for the hope that we have in you, Jesus. 
Thank you that what has happened to us is not the end, and what we have done is not the end. Thank you that new life is possible through Jesus Christ. So I pray if there's anybody here today that has never experienced that, that they would give their life to Jesus today. That they would acknowledge their sins and they would reach out in faith to Jesus Christ to save them. And may you give us healing and may you give us restoration and may you fill our hearts with love. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for listening to our series on 2 Samuel with Pastor Mark Doss. If you have questions about today's message, please contact our church office at info at topekabaptist.org. Give us a call at 785-862-0988 or check us out online at www.topekabaptist.org.